2020, there was a pandemic, so we couldn't visit again. 2019, we had the dinner together at the backyard of Professor Organ Bro House and San Cocho. Really appreciate Mrs. Organ Bro. This is the last photo we took there, Professor Organ Bro. During uh, 2012 and 19, Professor Ogenberg got funding from the NSF and he devoted himself to, to solve uncertainty problem in real life cases, real existing buildings. So I think you are familiar with the, the, uh, the uncertainty analysis. Forward from left to right and backward is uh, solving the Bayesian problem. So I think this is one of the Professor Ogenbro's significant, significant contribution to our domain. The first part, forward uncertainty analysis, was done by Dan David. He, the Delft, his former university. The lower part, the Beijing calibration, was done by Yun Su Ko, the Korean PhD. So he contributed in many different ways, writing good papers, educating good students, book, also uh, delivering keynote speech. So he was recognized as a tribute in the Journal of Building Performance Simulation, Journal of Energy and Buildings. Also he appeared in the Ipsa Youth Letter uh, uh, last year. This is one of the picture I like. Uh, this is the, done by the Professor Oppenberg student group to celebrate his birthday in 2019. Also, uh, in order to memorize his contribution, Peter initiated the Gottfried Ogenborough Memorial Prize fundraising since uh, last year. So we're collecting money and then we, the money will be used for uh, helping students to come to the Ibiza World Conference, only for students. Not only presenting my uh, work, I also brought uh, some of the uh, Korean PhDs, Professor Ogenbor educated, Yeon Jun Jung. He was admitted 2016, 2021, he finished. And the blue text is the, the, the meaning um, of the Professor Ogenbor to Yeon Jun Jung. So I wanna give you a moment to read text. Yeon Jun Jung is currently working on this project, but I wanna skip. Chen Jun Moon was admitted to, uh, in 2000 and graduated in 2005. His thesis about uh, uncertainty analysis in the mold growth. Currently working as a full professor, Dangung University in South Korea. Also, he wrote me this kind of text. The picture was taken at Hyderabad, India, 2015, a BS 2015 conference. Professor Moon is currently working on this project in South Korea. Very well recognized. Yeonsu, I think most of you are familiar with Yeonsu Ko. She was admitted in 2005 and graduated in 2011. PhD thesis about the Bayesian calibration and she was working at Argonne National Lab and then moved to University of Cambridge and currently working at Korea University. That's uh, her project currently working on. Ji Young Kim, uh, admitted in 2008, and PhD thesis is shown here, and this is the, the message from the Ji Young. And as you can see in the photo, Ji Young was crying after she finishes the final defense. Fried is smiling. And this is uh, her current uh, research work. Sang Hun, was graduated in 2012 and PhD. This is all about EPC and currently he is working at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. The photo was taken when Professor Ogenbro visited South Korea together with Dr. Lee and Dr. Kim, two Korean PhDs. Okay, this is the, the end of my presentation.
very specific, very specific note. First of all, uh, what, a, what a moving uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And um, I was very surprised uh, because Dr. Park actually uh, came from Korea for the event, uh, w w just told us that he's coming. Basically, it was just a surprise. I'm coming, so I'm done. Um, I have a very specific question. You had uh, the legacy of helping uh, students from your country, Korea, to come to Georgia Tech. There is a motivation behind that. There is support that comes from the other side as well. Um, when I was personally pursuing my doctorate, I was given that advice as well. You can stay in the United States and help students from your country to come and join you. And I'm wondering what's, um, it's the two-part question. The logic behind helping students in Korea to come to the United States, but also what you've learned from Freed about accepting students that you are helping to come to the United States. Pretty students accept to observe the Professor Ogenbro's teaching. So, so for your Many Korean, my students, as well as Korean uh, research community, very well understand the Professor Ogenbro teaching. Also, I think the, the nation doesn't matter whether you are in USA, whether you are in South Korea, but keeping, keeping in mind the, 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 the t teaching of the Professor Ogenbro, that, that is, I think, important. Thank you. Um. Again, very hard to follow up on this, Dr. Park, but I just wanted to kind of mention that, you know, there's uh, something interesting in there and how the legacy of Freed is continuing even to the lab to this day. I mean, you, you worked with them initially. You showed in your slides that you've worked with, you know, Yoon Suk Hyu. Um, and now we have uh, Vitor, which is one of our friends. He was in Korea as well, who was Yoon Suk Hyu's student. And she sent him here uh, to the HPBL, and he's now continuing this legacy with Dr. Tariq. He just graduated. So we're three generations in of people continuing that particular lineage. And I think that's a very beautiful thing, and we should always try to keep it up on the HPBL. I just wanted to let you know that th the seed that was planted initially is now sprouted three generations of researchers and hopefully more. Yeah, the children for Professor Ogenbro, grandchildren, grand grandchildren. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We'll take a break and come back at 12.20 for the final talk and then lunch.
Hello everyone. Now we will uh, we are going towards the last presentation for the event, and it is by uh, Dr. Peter De Wilde. Okay. Good afternoon. Very nice to see you here today. And um, I've titled my day unpacking. Complexity and um, and hoping to come to some things that emerge from. So, our reflection shared quite a lot of in there, and we change. Um, trying to get to to a common thread in there, and then look. Um, I, ref I wrote with Fritz. The first thing, starting point is my own. Will note is that I've been educated at the Delft architecture, then technology, and PhD. Um, from there, in a Georgia Tech, for and then went across to the life. Um, but so this background to the Netherlands is one thing that, of course, here is interesting. And if I look back at the road that I've traveled, far horizon and actually across the horizon, continent, Delft, where we had the common origin, the same country that we shared. And from there, I've gone through a whole range of projects and always Fritz was involved in one way or the other in what I was doing. And only very recently have I moved and I'm doing things no longer involved with. So if I go to the horizon, back to the, the far end and my first start, and I think this beats what anybody's been talking. We go back to 1994, and at that time I was doing my master's at TU Delft with another professor, Professor Rien van der Voorde, and I was in architecture, and you might not realize it, but Fried was in civil engineering. And my professor in architecture said, well, you should go to this other professor in civil engineering at a decent underpinning in heat and mass transfer. So I went across, and this was the book that we used, or the, the syllabus, and I opened it as an architect, and I almost got a heart infarct, because it starts with the small infinitesimal element with heat transfer in three dimensions and a differential equation, and I was about to run out of that class again, and it was only Fried that managed to actually get me through there, see that this is stuff that you can work with, that you can use, and that actually put me on this career that I've never quit ever since. It also shows the evolution in teaching, right? Because this type of dropping an architect or a civil engineering student straight into this differential equation, that's what we did 30 years ago. And you can see in the teaching and the way it's being developed today and how it's developed 
given to students. We've gone away from that approach, this hardcore physics, bang, here, and you eat it. So for my master's dissertation, I did a simulation from the building in the Netherlands. This is domestic property called the solar garden house, if you translate it. And I did computer simulations. And those were the days of Fortran on the DOS machine. And I actually used a computer program called BFAB that was written by Fried and uh, colleagues at the TU Delft. It was a second iteration of a tool that nobody mentioned anymore, but we started with AFAB. It was a finite element energy program. Then came the building element program, that is the BFAB that I used. And that is where actually Fried then moved to Atlanta and gave up in developing his own tool. But it was interesting in one of the conversations we had years later on, he said, I should have stayed with this, I could have developed it, then it would have been a program called CFAP, for Component Finite Element Program. And that would probably be something that would blow Energy Plus and all the likes still out of the water. And he was very convinced that was the way uh, that, that things could have gone. So after my master's, I went on to do a PhD. And like so many of you, I actually looked at the role of simulation in design. What was in the discussion with Fried very surprising to me. So I had this physics approach and I've seen this hardcore engineering thing in there, but he put me on a completely different path. He put me onto the, the path of looking at processes, and process modeling and gaining evidence from case studies. And that is a completely different field. And it's one of the things that today I have not heard a lot about, but Fried at one point in his life was also very deep into uh, project management. One of the first conferences I attended here in Georgia Tech was in 2000, which was a CIB 78 project management conference. And he had deep insights in that. One of his first uh, PhD students that started, I think, together with Charles Sue was Hans Verheij, who did something about project management and quality assurance in that side of things. So Fried was very broad and brought his students also in different, different areas. In 1997, as has been mentioned, Fried moved to the West. He was still plodding along on my PhD in the Netherlands, and he was like a remote supervisor. One of my treasured moments of the day was 3 o'clock when Fried would go online and email would come in. But in that time, uh, 2000, 1997, we also had the building simulation conference in Prague in the Czech Republic, and that was one of the first that I did together with Fried. Interesting, if you look at back at that, there's a report in the IBIPSA news that talks about the large building simulation conference being a success with 121 papers. Yeah, that's a different time. Another relic from that time is the mini CD from Energy Plus that Drew Crawley was throwing in the audience saying, this is your new tool and go play with it. And the third thing that was new for me at that time, we went to Prague. And if anybody has been to Prague, it is a very nice cultural city with all kinds of historic buildings. You go see the Carl's Bridge and all the, all the old buildings in the city. And Fried shocked me because he took me by the arm and said, we're going to visit the dancing house, Fred and Ginger, modern architecture on the outskirts of the city. And he, he kind of implanted in me this interest in not just looking at buildings from the energy point of view, but also having this wider architectural view. And I remember at that time he was doing presentations on hardcore simulations, and he always said, my colleagues in architecture want me to take, throw a picture of a real architecture building in every presentation. He was doing that religiously. I'm trying to do that as well. So that's why Fred and Ginger are here today. Then my postdoc time, my visit to the US, that was a, an interesting one because I call it a postdoc, but in fact it was a pre-doc. So I was still completing my PhD work at the TU Delft, but visited free to work for a year on him. And this was on this design analysis interface initiative. And I don't need to talk about it anymore because Chil Su has given you the rundown on it already. So that is in there. But one of the things that, that this project was about was combining process dimension of design with all this hardcore technology in there, simulation, but also the interoperability between tools. And we've talked about that, but I'd like to stress that that was one of Fried's first claims to fame. So the design analysis initiative run in the US, and that's why it has this name, 
But Fried became famous with a project called Combine, Computer Models for the Building Industry in Europe. And he always told me that the project that we did here was actually Combine 3. You just had to rename it differently because it was in a different location. So we went deep in the technology, but we also looked at the human side, and it made me realize that there was much more to free than meet the eye. And so I've been digging in the archive, and this is one of the black and white pictures. Not allowed to show them anymore. But this is combined too. Yeah? So when I was doing the project with Freed, I had to read and get my mind around what was done in Combine 1 and 2. Combine 2, he did all that stuff that Joel Su showed in his nice graph. So interoperability and connecting between tools. Set up a prototype and tested the prototype. And they called that the clinic. Why? Years before COVID, they dressed up with mouthpieces. And in the yellow circle, you see Freed having a good time with his friends at TU Delft in the Netherlands, other side of the Atlantic, working on this stuff. If you dig in that material, you also can kind of find all kind of weird things. So, for instance, it's pure science, but there's cartoons in there, in the report. Yeah? This is one that probably uh, struck and hang with me. The lack of information, and we're not able to do what we need to do, and we always need more data to underpin, and we're still guessing in the dark. That was one that really, really stuck with me. The time moved on, so in 2004, I defended my PhD at the TU Delft, one of the people on the committee there, so this is in the yellow circle. And then from there, I decided to move on to the United Kingdom. Well, first of all, that is getting to terms with the teaching load and a new environment and all that stuff. But I always kept in touch with Fried, and one of the things that started to emerge then in 2009 was a joint book chapter in a book uh, done with a colleague from me at UCL, the Handbook of Sustainable Building Design and Engineering, and that still exists and is in the second edition now. But that was the first time I really started to talk deeply with Fried about typical building simulation models like we always use them, physics-driven, the first principle ones, and these black box models, this machine data-driven learning in there. So that sits in that chapter and we start discussing that. From there on, I went on, managed to get a big grant on climate change adaptation, and again, guided with Reed on how to do things and see these distributions come up and uncertainty handling in there, of course, and all that, trying to predict what happens in the future and all the problems that are with that. And we were really struggling with, on the one hand, having a lot of data coming from the meteorological scientists that looks very convincing for what will happen in 2050. But do we really know how our buildings will look in 2050? What systems will be in there? Nobody in 2008 would have predicted the large shift to, to electrical that we have. Nobody would talk about the times of phones that we have in our arsenal these days. So that was really, really groundbreaking and guided by Fried in the background. Around that same time, because I had the grant, I had the possibility to get Fried into the UK once in a while. And we had a period, like later on, I was visiting with Joel Sue, but I also had a chance to get freed into Plymouth and Tepstock for a while. One of the things we did there was visit Stonehenge. And this was one of the touristical things that Freed had on his bucket list. And he said, well, if I come to visit you in Plymouth, then I'd like to make that trip and see this ancient monument on there. So one of the visits, we grabbed the car, drove, I think, two and a half hours, because it's still a long drive to the Salisbury Plains. We had a long drive through the countryside and actually went to this place, which is very special for a building science point of view, right? Because it is aligned with the solar eclipse on the right times of the year. And I always tell my students in Plymouth, and I will do the same to the students in Rathclyde, try to find an architect who can design a building that is aligned with the sun, and that tells you what day of the year it is. Good job done by those people 5,000 years ago, right? It really makes you, makes you wonder where we are today. On another project funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering on the energy performance gap, that was the hot topic in the UK at that time. But that was really also driven with free support where Fried had his S3 grant and started to do the uncertainty analysis. So as part of this project, I came across, did a workshop on the GURA W, the, the 
uh, Georgia Tech Uncertainty Analysis Workbench that Free developed. And that was an instrumental tool for being able to do this work and push forward. Around that same time, Fried was still visiting me, and I think his last visit to, to Tavistock, where I live, is in 2014. And this picture was taken, and it shows a, a different side of Fried. I had him as a mentor that supported me throughout, but he was also like a personal advisor that said, advised me at that point to make sure that I had my roots in place, that I bought a house and enjoyed life there. And he was not only engaging with me, but also with the family and the kids, right? So this shows him playing a game with my youngest son, Tom, who at the time was six years old, and really trying to bridge that generation gap. We already talked about networks and the academic family. Well, this is almost the academic granddaddy to my youngest son, right? 2015, I repeat the picture from Chul Su. So then we had the uh, conference in... Uh, Hyderabad in India, where Fried got his distinguished service apart from, uh, I was happy to be able to hand over to him because I was chairing the committee at that moment. But he also did the keynote on the, the uncertainty analysis and sensitivity analysis work. And Joel Su showed the picture, but I looked closer. And if you look closely, you can see actually the questions that he was asking about that subject. And it is very interesting to go back and to see how essential those questions are yeah so our talks about epcs well, who actually is served by higher fidelity models when is the model good enough how accurate do we have to be if we're wrong well do we need to wrong how are we and can you do something with this in industry and koftol is a demonstration that the answer to that one is yes yeah so but he was really fighting to to get deep into these things Another thing that stuck with me from this conference was that he had this long talk about uncertainty analysis and how you quantify all this stuff. And then he came up with a very funny slide, which actually had the face of a chimpanzee on it. And he said, if you do all this heavy lifting on uncertainty analysis and you talk to a policymaker or a client, it's like talking to a chimpanzee. You have for 30 seconds this deep connection and you think they've got what you're talking about. And then by the time you think, okay, now we're getting somewhere, then the chimpanzee sees a banana and goes hoo, 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 up in the tree and it, the game is over. So it's good to see that part of that legacy that we're trying to get beyond that. At that same time when the conference was, I remember talking Fried about this book project that I was setting up at that time. So over the next couple of years, I kind of disappeared behind my computer and I was writing this what he would jokingly call the bestseller on building performance analysis. I was hammering away on my keyboard in the background. But life continued. Yeah, so amongst others, we had the USA Building Simulation Conference in San Francisco in 2017, which uh, I did attend, but Fried did not. He sent his students. He thought it was better investment for the students to go across and learn from what was going on. But he was still influencing my past. So, I went to the conference and then took my family for a holiday. And amongst one of the things, I remember going towards Arizona and visiting Bryce Canyon. But Fried said, go visit the Kodak Chrome Base in State Park, which is next doors, but with a lot of less people in there. So we went there. We enjoyed it. So even on a personal level, he was still steering the path. Published my book, and I won't talk too much about that, but... One of the things that I am personally very proud of is to have the foreword by Fried to that work. Yeah, and I've copied some text on there. You can all read that. But it reflects back on this drive to Stonehenge and me bringing Fried to Devon countryside, which has these narrow lanes and which is interesting in terms of driving. I must have died to thousands deaths because I'm not as good a driver as he suggests here. But but he said, okay, this is a curvy and challenging road, and the same goes for the misconceptions in terms of we're still there, right? And we still need to continue this work to make sure that we do the right thing and move. I can talk about this book for ages, and I'm not going to do that today. But what I'm going to do is pick one thing that I actually picked from Fried in there. So in his chapter, and Joel Sue, I think, mentioned that as well. There's the book by um, Jan Hansen and Lambert, Roberto Lambert, where Fried has a chapter on simulation in design. And this graph is one that is really, every time I look at it, I can 
get deeper and deeper into this, but this is this misconception that you can take functions apart, take systems apart, and that they will map one to one. And the big example is the window that does a multiple sync, so it keeps the rain out, the sound out, it keeps the COVID inside, it does all kinds of things. One system mapping to different functions. And Fried was very early on in recognizing that and showing it. I think from my, my own contributions, um, I looked at requirements and what buildings need to do, and there's a lot more to uncover on that. Um, what I always, always like to highlight is that we have the functions that the building needs to do, that is just describing what it is that the building needs to do, requirements. And then the performance is always the question, how good the building does it. Yeah? And the how good can be split in three things, quality, the resource saving, and the workload capacity. And we tend to look always at the energy, maybe a little bit of lighting, but there is a long list of things that building does, and an even longer list of how you can measure that, that gets complex and really hard to, to, to manage. But if I go through an airport, it's not about being energy efficient. That is about how many passengers can we get onto the plane in how much time, and how much money can we extract before they get onto the plane, right? Going through the shopping center. I hate the shopping center, but it's there for a reason. Looking at that book, there's also a chapter number seven, and that was an interesting experience for me because I had a draft, I submitted that to Fried for his feedback, and he said, stuff is missing. You are kind of having the highlight in here, but the struggle of actually combining building with what it needs to do, with how you pick your tools, how you set your targets, your goals, your limits, and how you get all of that together, that is something that really is difficult to do. So that's one of the things that chapter that is really driven by Fried to have that in there and, and, and summarized in this, this graph where I try to bring together known methods, what humans need, how we can benchmark that, and in the end, how we get it to a performance measure. So one of the other things that came from the book, and we talked today a little bit about that, about performance gap and how close you can get your simulation to what we measure from buildings. One of the positions I've taken from the book is to actually step slightly away from that. I think that there's areas where we actually, thanks to people like Fried, we are in a relatively okay situation. So energy and temperature, we have measurements, we can go into buildings, we can measure temperatures, we can measure tem uh, energy use, and we're in a pretty decent situation. We have tools, okay, we can discuss whether it needs to be an EPC or an Energy Plus, but we have a whole range of software that can actually tackle that issue. We have consultants that specialize in this field and have expert opinions on it, and we can ask people that work in buildings and live in buildings what they make of it, and hopefully it all aligns on, on level. But there's other aspects that we ignore and where this set is not complete. Yeah? So one of the examples is fire test. In the UK, we had the Grenfell Tower fire a few years ago. And it's easy to put a component in a lab and test how it burns, but it is much more difficult to scale that up to a building and have the full complexity in there. And it means that the laboratory tests are limited on what you can do, so we have to rely on simulation. Another example is burglary. So we all expect our buildings to keep us safe, and when we close the door at night, nobody to come pick our stuff. We cannot simulate that. Yeah? The way you test that type of thing is in a lab to give somebody a hammer and a screwdriver or an electrical to try to get into a building. But simulation, we don't even have the tools, so let alone that we can start talking about performance gaps there. So key notions from me and where I agree with after having locked myself up in a room and write a book for five years. We need to go to the seminal work. We need to keep the work that others have done going, but that is difficult. And especially because I think people read less and less. I've just installed Instagram on my phone to see what my kids are doing, but I think I need to start teaching building physics in 15 second clips that you can go through like this, which is a difficult thing. Another thing is everybody talks about performance indicators and my call to action and Fried took that over and I was proud of him doing that. Stop talking about indicators and to instead talk about performance measures because 
the KPIs are kind of tainted by all the business people that turn your revenue and your performance into something that they can discuss. It is all relatively management speak. And Freed was always about, can we really measure what the building really does? So I think we talk about performance measures and there's a whole argument in the area of system engineering that can help back that up. Coming then back to performance gaps and where we are positioned, but also the Dutch legacy. I talked about those four approaches of measuring performance and that we have not only performance gap, but there's holes in the tool set. So being Dutch, sharing that legacy with free. I think we need to also pluck the holes in the dike. This is a famous story from a Dutch little guy that actually saved this village by having his finger in the hole in the dike. Yeah, so it's important that we do that before we start bridging the gaps because if there's holes in the dike, everything is underwater. Combined with that, if I see myself on a dike with a finger in a hole, I'm pretty sure I get my foot, feet in the mud and that relates back to that chapter seven and the need to realize that this is a complex world and that. So I published my book and after that I went in search and this was a present a cartoon I made for the last presentation we had here at the BT lunch with Fried. But at that time the United Kingdom was talking about Brexit and Theresa May was trying to find an agreement to get out of the U European Union. I was at that point searching for funding and man, it's the same story, right? But I was successful and one of the things that I managed to do, and again, it is thanks to my connection with Freed, I went into work on occupant behavior and I've done some work with Chul Su that is about, in a lot of buildings, it's very hard to predict what goes on. If you want to know whether a person is home in the weekend, very hard to, to know because Sometimes they are and they're just reading a book and they're inside. Other days they're deciding to go active and be away. If you want to look at, uh, I think, PhD students coming to the lab, some come early in the morning, some come at 11 at night and work overnight. It's very difficult. But I looked at the other side of the spectrum as well. So this is about hospitals and operation theaters. And this is work done with another friend that I actually met through Freed. So this is Matthew Bacon, who is a consultant of a small company in England, um, who liaised with Georgia Tech, had advice from Freed on how to run patient modeling pathways. So it goes back to the process dimension that a lot of you actually um, not seen here today, but he did a lot of work on that as well. And one of his staff is Yin Yu, who came from Georgia Tech and now works from him remotely. Things moved on, so we had the lockdown, and like many of you, that was kind of where I still had some communication with Fried by email. And I think this was one of my last in-depth communications. And this was about building simulation and those data-driven models. So it goes back to when I started at Plymouth and we wrote this chapter, but it's also the discussion that we have these days. And I left the Dutch time in there. I think we should also celebrate the Dutch legacy that Fried had. Um, but if I translate this, this is about data-driven projects and him saying, you know, it is, if you do this data-driven project, it sounds like it's easy to do, but you need to find your data, you need to clean your data, then you need to train your model, then you need to check your model. There's a lot of work that goes on. And he said, and that is what is the other image there, he said, you know, he, he stated here, he didn't know which was worse, the nightmare of having clean all that data and get your data-driven model trained. Plus, nice modeler bias and the uncertainty that goes with that if you go through the physics-based approach. And I still this question is still open, right? So we still don't have the answer to that. So from there, you know, time moved on and we had the set words of, of passing and all that entailed. And it means that for me, I have some post-free developments. And yes, I'm a full professor and I accolades in this world, but it is still very scary to be out in this world without of the guiding hand of the mentor that I had for 25 years. But some of the things that happened to me is I've got another project with Matthew Bacon on Conclude. We take this predicting of what happens in operation theaters on the one hand down to look at carbon that sits in instruments. So I suddenly am in the medical world looking at how to make a zero carbon NHS, National Health Service, which is topical in the UK. 
but also looking at the larger building center. I moved to Strathclyde, let go of the teaching load at Plymouth, which is at the moment very nice to have, keep writing funding bits, and trying to get back to the basics and carry on that legacy that I have from Fried. And that is where this reducing complexity in the title comes from. So a few slides about what's going on. So this predictor project that is about predicting energy use in uh, surgical instruments. It also fits back in how we reduce waiting lists. Very timely thing at the moment due to Kilvert. We have in the UK extreme long waiting lists. So that's an area that we need to work on. So happy to have that. I'm also at the moment looking at other things and looking around me what's going on. And one of the things that you see in the literature is this emerging interest in digital twins. And I'm sure that some of you have come across it and see images like this, where this was the building where I used to work in Plymouth and the model we had in Energy Plus from that. And it looks like we're already there, right? We're having a digital twin and we have a digital model, so we're, we're all good. It's interesting to know that other industries have different visions of what the digital twin is. Aircraft industry, we have models of specific planes, not just of the type of plane, but of specific planes that tell us how long the engine have been running, how much rubber is left on the tire, and then can be used for predictive maintenance and to tell when to put new tires on that plane. That means two-way communication between the real thing that you see on the top of the slide and the model that we have at the bottom. And I think at the moment we're still in this, or we're, some companies are claiming to start to move to digital twins. So in the in the Scotland, we have IES virtual environment. They have now plugins that allow you to take data from a real building and bring that into, our, into their simulation model. But that's not yet pushing it back. That's not doing that analysis, providing that service that will make a better building and will make an impact on the real thing. So I'm thinking about that and trying to get together actually at the moment an article that criticizes these things. And I think this comes back to this larger picture of the engineering knowledge, the physics, mass, where we started from back in 1994, the finite infinitesimal little cube and the heat transfer in there, how that relates to the world around us. There's a lot to be said about where we put the interest and where we actually want to focus and work on that. Some other stuff that I've been doing, so I'm involved with reaching out back to the European Union, and we're just submitted in January a uh, Horizon funding proposal. It's interesting to see that from the time from Combine, when Fried was successful in running that project in the, in the 90s, uh, it's completely different the emphasis is in how you write the funding bit. So this is really, if you join in this type of effort, you have people that almost make a living from writing these proposals on a daily basis. You need to kind of really get into this game and know what's going on. But it also shows all the interests that are across in the policy domain, how that relates to some of the stuff we're doing, right? So climate neutral, surfaces, performance-based knowledge generation, talking to energy serving companies, running pilots. It's a complex life that we live. We just try to, to keep going and connect the dots there. Some other work that I've done in the past and that I'm taking forward right now is the thermography. So yes, we have our models. World away from what you can do with our simulation software. So yes, we can do thermal bridges, but I'm not aware of any tools that run that on the full building level yet. Maybe GovTool will go in the direction. It will be interesting to hear about that. But then I work, for instance, with Tarek, and Tarek flies drones around the building, and suddenly we have a different view of what's happening and completely different data sets, and how do we connect them? More recently, I'm talking to guys that actually are planning to have a thermal camera on a satellite and look down from space and look at all cities and see what's going on there. How do we connect from that high up level to the plane or the drone level to what we see when we walk on the surface? Interesting challenge. So that's a lot of stuff to take in and a long road that we've traveled. So unpacking complexity. This is one of the many maps you can find if you Google about the research journey and everything that's in there. Yeah, this theory and the ocean of experience and all that stuff. 
where I always had the guiding hand to free to put me in the right direction and where I'm still trying to find my way now. So what do I crystallize from this if, if I go back and I look at what I've learned from Freed over the years? First of all, working on the right question. And, and the red work in the middle is the why. Yeah? Why do we do that? And I remember during my PhD, formulating the right question is the most difficult thing you do and everything else just applied. And I think that is true. And it's interesting if you deal with engineers, they're interested in the how. How can we use this in MATLAB and how can we make this model? Do we really need that? Do we need energy plus? Do we rather have the EPC model? This question of what is needed and why we do it, that is really at the forefront. And I think that's what I've taken away. Now, Fried had his agenda on the building simulation slide from 2015. I have my own agenda version. But what I've taken forward is that performance is more than energy alone. And I think there's around 70 aspects. Maybe we cover five of them or six, and we should look at all of them. And there's a lot of to do. And we need to prevent what is called the energy or carbon tunnel vision. I think we're too much doing one thing, but not looking at the world around us. I see a leaky dike, and I have only 10 fingers, so we need to start plugging some of those holes and make some of them. There's still the question about the performance gap that is not going away, so we need to deal with that. We need to talk about how building simulation and this building science fit with digital twins and artificial intelligence and machine learning. But it also comes back to why do we do all of this, and that is better buildings create a better world. And if I look around the news these mornings, oh man, we really need to work hard on that. So the effort is really needed to do that. But that's one slide of synthesis. This is probably my most used slide at the moment. And this states from an event that I unfortunately missed. So 2019, while I was taking the family on holiday, Fried had a farewell party thrown by his PhD students. And he made a presentation, and I've seen the slides, and he reflected on his career, and there's all kinds of wisdom in there. But he also said, well, okay, what are the things that I'm going to do after my retirement, and where do I want to focus? And he said, go back to the, the classic theory of building science, and the statements, all X or Y, that is the core of all fundamental knowledge. And I think that's true, right? We, we try to categorize the world around us, these things, bring them together in groups and, and try to identify what the properties of those, those sets of data are. So I've taken that as one of the drivers of what I really want to do myself as well. So if you talk to me about the digital twin, I say, what's the property of a digital twin? And how do we actually grab that? And how do we differentiate that from something else? So I've combined that statement of Fried with something I found in the mass, which is about how you can formulate mathematical projects, Again, tips, relationships, and if then statements. And I think that that really encaptures what we're trying to do, right? And trying to find out what we what we want to be and what we want to do in our. This is something that I use if I write conclusions for a paper. Get out this slide, look at these things, drive in there. So that is the second simplification and grabbing complexity that I've been taught by Fried. The third one is about people, because we talk all about content. But one of the things that Fried really instilled in me is the importance of working with others. And you've seen how Josu has grown into my digital twin, or my, at least my working twin. But there's a whole other range of people I work around, right? And there's a gaping hole in the middle where what I call, would call my academic father is now, now no longer with us. But I also remember that when he visited, he was, was, we had the jokes about PhD comics. You might have read those about the prophecy scheme, about the pyramid of people where there's one person at the top and then a layer beyond that, and it goes on and on. And you can make jokes about it at one point it topples over. But for me, it's important to be remember that, that with Fried, we have this community, and I'd like to keep that community going. Be people connect and, and build on what is going on. So moving forward, without Fried, making little baby steps in a world where the guiding hand is no longer there. One of the things I've already noted is that I had Fried as an excellent mentor that supported me throughout the years. 
personal guidance, work guidance, but also the odd case when you need a letter of support for a job application or that type of thing. So here is an offer to anybody in the Georgia Tech community that has this freed that can no longer ask freed for reference. If you need one, let me know. I'm happy to support that. I'm also aware that some universities want to mentor in place on a formal basis. So if anybody needs that service, I'm happy to do that and you know where to find me. The final one, so Sue already spilled the beans on this, but one of the things that happened after Fried passed away, we wrote the uh, articles in the journals of have the obituaries out and read that way. But uh, Zawa Yang Zeng, who now works at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab said, can we not organize something in memory of keep this legacy going? So based on that, last year we ran a survey to ask whether people would be interested in doing this type of thing and how we should form that. Based on that, we've started around a month ago a, a fundraiser to start a Fried Augenbro Memorial Prize. We have around, I think, 15,000 pounds already collected on this, this thing. Given on the feedback that people have been given, this will be running through the IBIPSA community. That was where Fried's heart really was. And it will be a prize for a young doctoral student. So IBIPSA already has a young contributor award, but that typically goes to somebody who's just made the grade and, and has already demonstrated. This is one level down, and that is where Fried's really was with his heart, right? Guiding the, the young students towards their PhD. This will be a prize that will be coming on that cycle of the, the every two years of the IBIPSA conference. Named after Fried, supported by the community, supporting young students. So even if he's no longer with us, he will still support students going forward. And we hope to run that for 20 years at least in the future, right? So back to 2044 when I retire, then we still will be talking about Fried Memorial. I think that is a nice way to keep remembering in, in the long future. What's my final slide? If you want to donate, well, you can find us on, on GoFundMe. That's where the main platform is. Or you can also talk to me. Or Thank you. Three things before we conclude. I know I'm between you and food, but three things. The first thing is we have a picture. Just wanted to show everyone something. So this is Fried's grandchild who's watching the symposium. So we just wanted to let everyone know that we have visitors from all, all grades. Life. Let's, let's say it like that. That's the first thing. So um, the second thing is um, I thank the students in the beginning of the day. I'd like to thank them again. But this time, I'd like to ask for a round of applause. <laughs> this officially kicks off the IBIPSA Georgia Tech um, chapter, which is something I'm certain Reed would have been of support of. Um, and then the third thing are we have two, two notes. Uh, I'd like, without an introduction, I'll invite Tyler Pillay, who will introduce why I asked him to come at the end of the, uh, of the event. And then I'll uh, ask uh, Aniki to come for one last thought. And when Aniki's done, lunch is open. No, no more words. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Tyler Pillay. Um, so I actually just defended my PhD yesterday, and I was very interested in, thank you, successfully defended my PhD yesterday. Thank you. Dr. Pillay, soon to come, once I file the paperwork. Um, but so I really did want to do something for the symposium, and I was very interested in potentially submitting a presentation, but it was just way too much based upon 
uh, all that was happening with the defense and everything like that. Um, so I just uh, defended yesterday, and it's important to note that I am the last student that was admitted under Freed. Um, so a little bit of background as to how I met Freed. Um, whenever I was doing research in undergrad, I was thinking about going to grad school, and I was just reading all kinds of papers from a lot of different domains. And I came across this guy, Godfrey Doggenbro. And I thought he was just doing such interesting work that I just sent him an email. And I didn't really Google him or anything. I just found his email in a paper, sent him an email. And then I, I started doing some Googling and I realized, oh, this guy's got a lot of citations. He's got a big H index. He's never gonna respond to me. Um, and that's actually not true. He responded within like two hours. Um, and then it was maybe two or three days later, I was driving to Atlanta to come meet Freed. And that was insane to me um, because I was just considering grad school. I never really had that much experience. I was just an undergrad. He was willing to take the time out of his day to talk to me and to really hear me out. And I just thought that was incredible because you always hear these um, these stories about, oh, terrible advisors for PhDs, like watch out for them. You may end up just being a workhorse and all things like that. But Freed was the opposite of that. Freed actually wanted to hear me out and wanted to interact with me as a person. And he really did care about his students. Um, so during my PhD, I had a lot of uncertainty. Um, it wouldn't be a PhD with Freed if there was no uncertainty involved. Um, but really from the get-go, there was like a lot of uncertainty as to whether or not I would be able to stay at Georgia Tech, just based upon the fact that I could not afford to be here. Um, funding was, was finicky at times. Um, and there was actually a point in which, I don't know if Freed ever told his family this, but Freed actually offered to pay for my tuition for a semester so that I would stay in school. And I have never met another person who was willing to be that selfless and to even offer something like that, whether or not he expected me to actually take it. I don't know, but um, it's just incredible. And it really is such a, a judge of character uh, to show that he cared that much about his students and that he really cared that much about our success. And I, from all of this is that all of his students are his success. And whenever I asked him why he would offer me money, he said it was an investment. Um, and that really is, that he invested his time and his care in all of us and our success is his success. So thank you all for being here and uh, thank you for your time. Hello. So I worked with Freed closely for 24 years because I'm his daughter. <laughs> um, but I just, I wasn't going to say anything today. I just wrote a bunch of notes on my phone because I felt so moved that this was so touching that we had this, that you guys cared as much about him as, as of course we did. Um, give me a second. Um, so the talks were so lovely. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts. I know some of you tuned into the funeral and I shared, you know, some things that students sent him, but I felt, you know, I walked away from that feeling I hadn't, I hadn't done that justice. So I'm glad that we were all able to like take this time and, and really hear from you guys and, and how he impacted your life. So. It's also amazing to see the impact that he had on everyone and all of these brilliant minds in the room and all of the amazing things that are going to continue to happen and how his impact is going to continue. So you saw uh, baby Mia, who is watching from the Netherlands. That's my oldest sister's daughter. My other sister, she's in NOLA right now, but she was able to also see, and maybe you might remember if you saw the funeral, uh, my cousin Glennie, who um, my father paid for her education and really, she viewed him also as a father figure, and she sent me a really sweet text that I would like to, to read to you. And I think that you will also feel a lot of the sentiments. Um, she says, I'm touched and surprised. On how many lives he impacted so deeply. 
not because I didn't think he was able to do so, but because when I was with him, he made me feel like I was the entire world. He had the ability to make everyone the center of the universe. I see that that translated to his students and colleagues. He always had time for us, always answered every single email and call and text. And when he was with you, he was present, attentive, interested, almost made you think that he didn't have anything else going on. He really mastered the art of human interaction. Lessons that he taught us go beyond any professional field. And I want you all to know, you guys saw, of course, Freed at work. He was just as compassionate playful and had that aura of clarity that we saw in Aaliyah's um, cartoon uh, at home, just like he had did at work. And someone mentioned earlier, you know, that um, you were all his family just as much as we are. And I hope that we will continue to think of him every time that we're faced with a problem and take a pause to think about the things that we can really simplify. Simplify what we can, optimize what we should, practice humility when it's least expected of us, and laugh any chance we get. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending.